What's the point exactly of the male orgasm? If you're a Mesopotamian deity, it's just to make babies. You don't really need to enjoy it. In this video, we will discuss the role of phallicism in Sumerian literary compositions, consider what the whole point of the male orgasm is, as I told you before, it's to get ladies pregnant, and also consider the contrast in female voice and the importance of sexual pleasure for women. Like, subscribe, come along for the ride. Hello everybody, welcome back to Sex and Eroticism in Mesopotamian Literature. This is episode 11, Penis Envy, or Phallicism in Sumerian Literature. This video will look at the connection between phallicism and reproduction, answer the question everyone wants to have the answer to, what about the foreplay, and then look at the woman's role in all of this, focusing on the goddess Inanna in the myth Inanna and Shukali Tuda. So, phallicism and reproduction. Gwendolyn Light quotes Gerald Cooper from Enki's member Eros and Irrigation in Sumerian Literature. Enki's sexuality is raw, often violent, phallocentric and reproductive on both metaphoric and the concrete levels. Like asks, is this applicable to the general presentation of masculine sexuality in these myths? Well, she definitely agrees that phallicism in Sumerian texts focuses almost exclusively on reproduction. In the myths that we've looked at, the male deities are solely responsible for fertilization. Women merely provide the location in which a fetus can gestate. The primary impetus for the creation of the children comes from the male figure. Therefore, in these texts, male sexuality is primarily viewed from a reproductive aspect, with the fertilizing power of semen as a recurring theme. And this links in also with the fertilizing power of water for agricultural purposes, again because the cuneiform sign for water and semen is the same. Interestingly, all of the mythological texts we've looked at so far, including Enki and Nin Hosang and Enlil and Ninlil, focus on reproduction and the male's role in this. In fact, in Enki and Nin Hosang, Enki's semen doesn't even need a womb to procreate. Just ejaculating on the ground provides enough creative force for plants to sprout. Also interestingly, the male gods in these myths achieve impregnation every time they orgasm, which like suggests is the manner in which these male deities prove their masculinity, through their ability to procreate. As you may have noticed in the texts we've looked at, there's very little emphasis on eroticism or sensuality. There's almost nothing in the way of foreplay with the exception of some references to kissing. Male deities don't so much seduce the female deities as much as announce that they wish to have sex now and would you please lie down. This contrasts very strongly to the female voices present in other Mesopotamian literary texts, which we'll be looking at later in this series. The female voice is just much more focused on sexual pleasure. In fact, in the texts we've looked at, there's no real enjoyment shown by either participant during the sexual act, and like suggests that that's because it's completely irrelevant to the reproductive focus of these texts. It really doesn't matter if the participants enjoy the sex, so long as someone gets pregnant at the end. This doesn't just count for the women in the texts, this counts for the men as well. Nowhere that I'm aware of do Enlil and Enki voice their enjoyment of what's going on. They voice their desire, but they don't say that they are enjoying it or that it's a pleasurable experience. The focus is solely on the reproductive act. Like makes the point that we should not take this as reflective of Sumerian society, mainly because these are gods, they're not mortals, so their actions should not be taken as a model for mortal behaviour. It simply, she argues, reflects the reproductive function of the males in these textual depictions. It's also important to note that law texts show us that rape was a punishable offence. Regardless of the fact that in these myths the goddesses are often seen as unwilling participants, there are no repercussions for the male gods, this does not reflect Sumerian society at all. Law texts show that rape was a punishable offence, though the offence was viewed to have been committed against the uh, male owner of the women, either their father, brother or husband. Like argues that the reason there are almost no repercussions in these texts is because these myths do not operate in social locations. They're used to demonstrate the difference between the way things were for the gods 
outside of society, outside of civilization, and the present in which the writer operates. Even the myth Enlil and Ninlil, which is set in a social context, has very minimal repercussions for both participants. Enlil is banished, but not for terribly long, and he still retains his status as uh, city god of Nippur. And Ninlil appears to suffer no loss of status. She is not shamed. She does not seem to bring dishonor on her family. In fact, through her actions, through her sexual promiscuity, she gains status. She transitions from youth into full adulthood, like argues because she is able to become pregnant, and importantly in this particular myth, because she's able to bear multiple children at the same time. In this chapter, Gwendolyn Lyke brings in the goddess Inanna to provide an alternative reading of eroticism in Mesopotamia. The goddess Inanna, as I'm sure you know, is generally acknowledged as the goddess of love. She's the main character in many, many erotic texts from Mesopotamia. And in the myth Inanna and Shukali Tuda, the goddess Inanna falls asleep in a garden and is then raped by a gardener, Shukali Tuda, while she's asleep. She wakes up and is very angry and basically wreaks havoc on humanity in revenge for Shukali Tuda's actions. Like makes the point that in many other erotic texts featuring the goddess, her sexual pleasure is the most important part of the story. She's very vocal about wanting to have sexual encounters, she's very vocal about her desire for men and gods, and Like argues that her rage here at Shukali Tuda is because she has been used as an object of phallic impulse. He's used her for his own pleasure and completely ignored her sexual pleasure. Like also brings up a passage in the Gilgamesh epic in which Gilgamesh is recounting various failed relationships of Inanna's, including when a man called Ishulanu, I think another gardener, refuses her advances. And Gilgamesh here also refuses her advances. She says that he's very beautiful and she would like to marry him, and she, he refuses her. And she's completely and utterly enraged in both instances. Like here identifies the problem as the fact that, in all instances, the man in question refuses to give the goddess the sexual pleasure that she is either seeking or is entitled to. Shukali Tuda satisfies his lust upon the sleeping goddess without her invitation. With Ishulanu, it is the goddess who invites him to have sex with her, but he refuses. And just a break here, the same happens in Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh refuses to have sex with Inanna. As far as the goddess is concerned, this comes down to the same thing, as intercourse during a deep sleep is not what she would call an erotic experience worth having. The hubris here is his failure to give her pleasure. So the problem here is not necessarily that Inanna was raped, although I can see that being problematic. It's the fact that in each instance, the goddess is being denied sexual pleasure that she feels she is entitled to. This is a, a completely different aspect of Mesopotamian sexual metaphor, of Mesopotamian eroticism, to the very male-centric texts that we've been looking at. In Enlil and Ninlil, in Enki and Ninhursang, sexual pleasure really is not terribly important, and Like is arguing that this is because male sexuality is inherently bound up in reproduction. Female sexuality doesn't seem to have that same connotation in Mesopotamia, so when you have a female voice in these myths, by and large, that voice is seeking some kind of sexual gratification. In summation, phallicism is intensely linked to reproduction in Sumerian mythology and literature. Erotic pleasure seems to be largely irrelevant in these texts for both male and female participants, because the phallus is not, as Like puts it, an instrument of pleasure. Instead, it's simply the means by which reproduction occurs. This should not, however, be taken as evidence for Sumerian society. As I stated earlier, not only was rape a legal offence against the property of another man, but when you look at texts that focus on the female experience of sex, sexual pleasure is actually very important. Although, again, the penis may have played only a minor role in these matters. Join me next time. For women are from Venus, femininity, eroticism, and the goddess Inanna. And remember, until next time, always ask, how do you know that?